Welcome, Walter. Good evening. There are many reasons to conserve, to carefully look after landscapes worldwide. We've heard just earlier how we humans have an innate connection, an innate pleasure that we're getting, obviously, around a being in these amazing landscapes. Some of the most amazing ones among them are actually here in, in California. Many, many reasons, cultural, spiritual values, uh, more mundane, carbon sequestration, recreation, as well as uh, just the need to maintain and sustain the last wild places for future generations. But I would argue that species are the absolute key in all of this. They are the critical elements underpinning the ecosystems that constitute these landscapes. They are the nodes on this very intricate, intricate web of life that's ultimately behind nature's benefits to people. And actually, in some of the, the most intriguing discussions today, we, we were told and got a nod from the audience that this is not just about ourselves right now. It's really for the future generations that we need to sustain biodiversity, that we need to ensure that future generations will have these benefits that, in some cases, we're not even aware of uh, at this point actually in most cases. Now, as populations decline worldwide, and we read about it in the newspapers and North American birds, for example, just recently, it's just, uh, a very dire situation and uh, one that we need to be incredibly concerned about. But I would argue that nothing, nothing at all, is more troubling than losing species for forever. Looking at these examples here, the one at the bottom, the oil bird, it's been separated from its closest living relative for over 70 million years. It's a, a key seed disperser in South America, carrying seeds in a single night up to 200 kilometers. And it's actually, if you were to lose that species altogether, we'd probably see a change in the structure of the forests there. So each one of these species serves a really fundamental role. How, do we can, how can we then put species into this landscape or landscape conservation equation? And this is where Ed Wilson's pioneering work actually comes into play. Back in the 60s, um, he pioneered the theory of island biogeography together with uh, Robert McArthur. And it offered uh, an almost transformational principle to go from species to conservation planning um, in, a, in a geographic context. So bear with me for a moment. This is how this started out. It's simply from the observation that as you roam around the Caribbean um, and identify lizards in all these islands, you obviously realize that more species are found on larger islands. And others then took that principle further and applied it to habitat fragments. So uh, islands of habitats uh, arising through encroachment. And here, again, we find that smaller and smaller fragments hold fewer species. And you can flip this around and essentially make it a dynamic principle around habitat loss leading to species uh, loss, species reduction. And, and it's somewhere in the middle there that you could argue and, and you could think of these original equations and put them into the picture here and say, well, uh, we really wouldn't want to go beyond that point there, beyond, beyond say, nine, we, wanna, we wouldn't want to lose more than 10% of species. And that is what brings us to this half. That's half the area lost. And I'm, I'm saying this because this is, if you will, the guiding principle behind uh, Half Earth, the Half Earth project, and what Ed is talking about in so eloquently in his book, Half Earth. And that's what's bringing us together tonight. And science has moved uh, quite a bit since the 60s, and we are now in an, uh, able to think about not just species richness or this aggregate number of species as a whole, but we're able to think about the similar sort of principles, species by species. So what is that curve, species by species, and how uh, does land cover change and climate change ultimately affect their survival, and what can we do against that? Uh, how can we uh, sustain species going forward, for example, through reserves or other sort of conservation management? So this is where the really tricky science comes in, 
and uh, that's where we see our role uh, to deliver the science and information to ensure that species are at least not unknowingly left behind. There's no question, well, there will have to be triage. We can't save every species from extinction. However, at least we want to do it in an informed way. And that's where I see our work, the science work in the half of project and the people engaging around it, the scientific community that we're engaging in this conversation uh, come into play. Deliver the science, the R&D, if you will, for effective conservation decision making. And that's where this species is coming in, in a critical way, the California Frasher. I hope many of you had, this, had the chance to see this species. It's not just uh, an amazingly, uh, it's, it's quite a character of a species if you see it in nature. Uh, it's got this uh, kind of uh, quite uh, a dominant beak and a uh, very agile manner about it. It's uh, also a really important element of the chaparral communities around here in, in, in California. It's an important node in that food web, and uh, um, it's uh, also an indicator of, of a healthy chaparral. So I encourage you to find it and think about it, not just as an important species, but also as one that's intrigued scientists such as Joseph Grinnell at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology here at Berkeley about 100 years ago. And he came up with this principle of connecting uh, species habitat associations or environmental associations with where they are then found on the map. And it, it was an absolutely empowering principle, I would say almost as much as island biogeography, that's now gaining new importance, for example, through the availability of high resolution remote sensing data. We have detailed maps of the planet, uh, not just static maps, dynamic maps that allow us to monitor change. And we have an increasing amount of new data sources also for biodiversity, citizen science observations, camera traps, GPS tracking data. So there's an immense amount of data coming through that we can then use in this uh, same way in, in which Grinnell thought about learning about species environmental needs. You can take this data, link it up to the remote sensing inf information, think about a multivariate niche that characterizes a species and then put that back into geographic space. And that's what we're doing uh, increasingly at scale in, in Map of Life, where we're able to go from relatively limited information, such as these expert uh, uh, green expert blobs, or relatively limited and often biased, roadside bias, we call that, uh, point data from citizen science observations, for example, to something that then integrates these pieces and gets us to something that actually is, has a spatial resolution that can be actionable on the ground. It's this red, more detailed map you see in the background there. And it's integrating these two pieces of information and realizing that the experts aren't always right and the points aren't uh, always where they should be. And we're now getting to something that can be a scientific basis for conservation decision making. And we've been able to scale this up uh, at least in a, in a coarse way to uh, almost 40,000 species to identify um, in a comparable way the most important places for additional conservation action in the world. So these are not maps of richness, these are maps of uh, importance sort of in a complementarity uh, context of particular places. And actually California, um, you wouldn't be surprised, uh, shows up here as, as quite an important location. And through the Half Earth map, we are then able to put this in, a, in an engaging visual way online. I encourage you to check it out at, uh, at the Half Earth website. And we're able to not just map the uh, encroachment or protection in great detail, but increasingly also the species that would be triggering a place that's showing up uh, as important. And we can look at a whole range of species here that are of global significance, for which this region of, of Central Southern California holds uh, globally, global stewardship uh, for a whole range of species and, and start a, conservation around, a conversation around them. For example, the Hermann's a kangaroo rat that still has a rather limited evidence base to then actually drive forward particular conservation action. And in California, we are in a really special place for that. Um, an immense number of species, an immense portion of those species um, of uh, endemic restricted to that place. And we had a, a wonderful uh, conversation today around the biodiversity in California over 1,600 plant species restricted, uh, over dozens and dozens of mammals, birds, amphibians uh, restricted to California. California holds the sole stewardship 
for these species. And then it holds partial stewardship for a lot of other species that it shares with Nevada or Arizona. So that's the sort of global information, global context that we're able to bring in through activities such as the half-earth uh, global mapping. So we talked about these cases today uh, in our conversations with the California panel and uh, the data, the evidence base, as well as the science um, came out as leading here for California, unsurprisingly. We had important conversations around the importance of bringing people, uh, social issues, uh, working landscapes into this conversation, as well as uh, adaptive, climate adaptive uh, uh, conservation approaches. It was uh, almost a goosebump inducing to then have um, people such as Wade Crawford and Chuck Bonham uh, on the panel to reflect on some of these uh, speeches that we heard from the scientists and give their response and their uh, forward-looking vision as to how Californian, California could go forward in uh, uh, practical uh, conservation. And uh, again, California is a leading example for conservation policy and action and actually holding almost a global responsibility and being able to carry this to other places, potentially in a half-earth context. And there was the call for actionable scientific information of the sort that, for example, is done here at Berkeley. So this, again, is not a richness map of the plants of California. It's the places uh, that are gaps at this point. Thousands of species were analyzed and modeled in great detail of the, in the way I was talking about earlier. And these are the current conservation gaps and a tremendous amount of outstanding conservation already done at California. In some ways, over half of California already conserved. However, there are important gaps. And uh, here are just some of them, and I want to finish on a, on a, on a really optimist and, and positive note, because uh, that one over here, and we have the, the very person in the audience today, uh, is, uh, for example, now conserved. Uh, Jack and Laura Dengamon Preserve, and with that, I'd like to thank you.